Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Tatul Khan. I'm the consultant neurologist at Houston Medical Clerkship. Uh, today we have Dr. Mustafa Shah, a graduate from Daw Medical College from Pakistan, uh, aspiring to become a neurologist. And we have a very interesting topic of dystonia today. Hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Khan, for the presentation. So, as Dr. Khan said, I'm going to be presenting on dystonia. In this presentation, I hope to give you guys a good background of what dystonia is, how dystonia happens in terms of the pathophysiology and the pathogenesis, how the patient looks, how we can proceed with the patient's workup and management, and we're going to wrap it up by studying an interesting differential diagnosis and a case study. I hope you guys like it. Thank you. So we're going to start with the definition. Dystonia is defined as involuntary sustained muscle contraction, and these muscle contractions can manifest as either sustained postures, they can be twisting or repetitive movements, or we can even get tremors. And the interesting thing about dystonia is that these movements or these abnormal uh, contractions, they can often be initiated or worsened by involuntary movements. In this way, dystonia is considered a dynamic disorder because the severity changes as we initiate or uh, attempt movement. I'm gonna move on talking about the normal physiology, pathophysiology, and the subdivisions of dystonia. So over here, this seems like a big slide, but I want to give you guys an overview of who the main players are in the normal physiology of motor movements. So we have four main players. The first one is your cortex. As we all know, the cortex sends down your neural connections and sends down the commands for movement. But it's more complex than that. So your cortex, which includes your prefrontal cortex, your supplementary motor areas, and your motor cortex, sends down the motor information or the commands your basal ganglia. As we know, the basal ganglia is a network. It has multiple components. It has the putamen, the globus pallidus, the substantia nigra. These, this network or this circuit acts in such a way as to promote movements that are conducive to the action we are attempting and to discourage movements that are um, opposing or antagonistic to the action that we are attempting. At the same time, these circuits are linked to the thalamus and the cerebellum. As we all know, the cerebellum is like the master of control of all movements, and it has an important role in um, the keeping a check on the how the movements are going and reading back to the brain on any corrections we really need to make in movement. So it's a two-way circuit. At the same time, the cortex sends input to the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, and thalamus, and these people relay back information to the motor cortex so it can learn and modulate movement accordingly. That is the normal physiology. To understand the pathophysiology, it's essential we look into this circuit within the basal ganglia. So this circuit consists of two parts. There's the direct pathway and there's the indirect pathway. This might look a bit um, with detail, but it's easy to understand once we simplify it. We have two actions going on here, action one and action two. So action one you might think as um, lifting a dumbbell. In that case, we want to activate our agonist muscles, in this case the bicep, and we want to relax our antagonist muscles, which in this case would be your tricep. We have circuits going from the cortex to the basal ganglia, which innervate the direct pathway. The direct pathway is indicated by the red dots, and which also innervate the indirect pathway, which is your green dots. In this way, we get inputs that cause contraction of the biceps and relaxation of the triceps, and you can do your dumbbell curls. If there's any action that opposes your movements in case of complex movements, like you're playing a game, is any action or motors, uh, motor uh, pattern that you want to inhibit. In that case, we would have the opposite situation happening. So in this way, the circuit works. We promote the movement of the agonist, and we inhibit the movement of the antagonist. This information is relayed down to your thalamus, and it's sent back to the cortex. An important caveat is, at this, during this entire process of performing complex motor movements, the brain is learning. And the way it learns is that it reinforces the movements that are desired or the motor routines that are desired, and it inhibits those that are undesired by altering the flow of dopamine. So these yellow arrows, they're the dopamine inputs. The solid arrows show that it's reinforcing motor routines which are required, and the dotted arrows show that it's inhibiting motor routines which are not conducive to our actions. So summing up, the core factors in dystonia would include dysfunction of the basal ganglia, dysfunction of the cerebellum, abnormal neuroplasticity because the brain has to constantly learn which movements it wants to perform it and which movements it wants to inhibit, and there are abnormalities in the sensory motor system. This is very important because 
your sensory organs, your vulgar tendon organs, and your sensory receptors. They let you know where the movement is going, if you're overshooting or undershooting your target. And that is all information that has to be relayed to your circuit. Moving on, so now we're going to divide the stonia into hypo or hyperkinetic. And there are four main there are four main diagrams here which depict the normal situation and three pathologic conditions of hypokinetic dystonia. The normal situation is basically what I described. You have your direct pathway and you have your indirect pathway. The indirect pathway is indicated by the I SKN and SKN is spinal projection neurons and your direct pathway is your DSKN. Dopamine normally innervates both. It innervates the direct pathway through your D1 receptors which are stimulatory. As we discussed, the stimulatory receptors would innervate your agonist muscles, for example, your biceps, and your indirect pathway will have your D2 receptors, which are inhibitory, and which will inhibit your antagonist, so you can have a smooth movement. In, in all these cases, D, which is Parkinson's, C, which is your dopamine response to dystonia, and D, which is your target dystonia, the core thing that's happening is that there's an imbalance between the equilibrium that's supposed to exist between the direct pathway and the indirect pathway. So for example, in Parkinson's, you're seeing that over here, the the output through the indirect pathway is increased and that through the direct pathway is decreased. So as you can imagine, that's going to lead to an inhibition of movement. When we think of a Parkinson's patient, we see someone who's really kinetic, who has difficulty initiating and uh, continuing movements. And this is why, because the indirect pathway is overstimulated compared to the direct pathway. Similar situations in dopamine response to dystonia and in our target dyskinesia, for one, for one reason or the other, the indirect pathway is stimulated more than the direct pathway. The second subtype would be your hyperkinetic syndrome. In this case, we have the normal situation, which is our equilibrium, and we have our three pathologic conditions, which include levodopandose dystonia, isolated dystonia, and paradusmal kinesigenic dyskinesia. The core feature in all of these is that, in this case, the opposite is happening. The direct pathway is stimulated more than the indirect pathway. So you're getting excessive movement. And that is what causes the sustained contractions, the rhythmic movements, and all that. Another thing that is important to note, as we mentioned in our in the first diagrams, is that dopamine is a major player in the circuit, as are the other neuro neurotransmitters that are part of the circuit. So we have GABA, we have ACH, and we have glutamate. And GABA and ACH are your are your inhibitory neurotransmitters. So these will basically help to modulate movement. In some disorders, these are the neurotransmitters that are implicated. For example, in CNTD, GABAergic interneurons have altered activity, and that results in alterations of your motor function. So now we've got our gist. We know what dystonia is. We know why it happens. We're going to look at the patients now. So to understand the motor features of dystonia, we we need to know that dystonia, because it can affect so many different muscle groups and so many different parts of the body, it can give you a very diverse picture of what it looks like. The classic idea that comes to mind when thinking dystonia would be of someone who has cervical dystonia, which is sustained contractions of your neck muscles. And that is indeed one of the most common. Dystonias can also be patterned, twisting, and heavy tremulous. And as we mentioned, they can be initiated or worsened by one reaction. And this is due to a phenomenon known as the overflow muscle activation. The overflow activation means that there's unintentional muscle contraction in an anatomically distinct site at peak of dystonic movements. An interesting caveat is the dystonic tremor, which is caused by contractions of dystonic muscles and may be exacerbated to maintain a primary normal posture. So you can imagine how distressing that might be for patients. They have an abnormal posture or abnormal movement, and any voluntary attempts to rectify that movement only worsens it. There is a very interesting video of the power spasm where we can see, you can see here that there are involuntary contractions of the ocular muscles. Similarly, the next one is also interesting. The next one is a case of laryngeal dystonia. 
her voice is a bit hoarse, and as she speaks, there are almost spasm-like contractions, causing a sort of break in her speech. And that's because of the involuntary muscle contractions within the muscles of her uh, vocal cords and the pathway of her speech. The dystonia can be very heterogeneous. It's important to note that dystonia should not be considered only with respect to its motor implications. There are also very significant non-motor implications. Dystonia is often associated with syndromes and conditions where other parts of the nervous system can be affected. As a consequence, people have com related comorbidities. Psychiatric comorbidity is quite common. Patients often have depression and anxiety. One of the patients with dystonia that I recently saw a month ago, she was um, suffering from depression as a result of dystonia, and she was quite distressed. Cervical dystonias, as we mentioned, are among the most common ones, and higher dystonia severity obviously affects their physical functioning, it affects their social life, it causes emotional dysfunction, and overall a lower health-related quality of life. In this, in this basic case diagram, we can see a good summary of dystonias, I will get to the etiology in the subsequent slides, but it's important to know that dystonias may be due to idiopathic causes or acquired causes or even inherited causes. It's very common, it's the third most common movement disorder in the US. It can be classified according to the clinical subtype into primary dystonia, secondary dystonia plus syndromes, which are the more complex ones, which have other neurological features, and you have hero neurodegenerative dystonias as well. And over here we can see which different muscles they can affect. We already talked about the eyes, we talked about the head tilting and cervical dystonia, the difficulty speaking, shoulder raise, and related signs and symptoms. So now we're gonna go on to the classification. As we saw in the last slide, classification can be across two axes. The first axis would be your clinical features, and second axis would be your etiologies. As we mentioned in the past one, your clinical features can uh, divide you into cases which may be of isolated dystonia in which you just have the dystonic contractions and movements and there are no other neurologic features. Beyond that we can have generalized isolated dystonia. In this case the dystonia is also isolated. There aren't other neurological problems going on but instead of being isolated to one part of the body, for example your neck, it's more generalized occurring um, in different parts of the body. So it can start in one limb and then progress to other limbs in the body as well. We also have focal segmental isolated dystonia, which is also quite common. It usually involves the cranial cervical muscles or arms. And as we mentioned, combined dystonia is that type of dystonia in which we have additional features. These may be Parkinson's, these may be myoclonus, and other neurologic deficits because it's part of wide area of the brain and the motor circuit that it's involving. The second axis talks about the etiologies. So when we ask, when we see a patient with dystonia, we ask ourselves the question. Is this primary, which means is it um, not due to any secondary cause? Is the dystonia happening on its own? If it is, then we call it primary dystonia. These can be divided into early onset or adult onset. If it's getting an early onset dystonia, we're more inclined to think about genetic causes, as we saw in the previous slides. And adult onset dystonia can involve your cervical cranial vector muscles. We're less inclined to look for genetic causes in adult onset, but it should still be a possible consideration. And among adult onset dystonias, it should be noted that cervical dystonia is the most common form, and it's also much more common than early onset primary dystonia. So that's likely what you would see in the clinic. Secondary dystonias can be due, due to a wide variety of neurological inputs. These could be head injuries, they could be drug side effects, it could be neurological disease. And as we mentioned in the case of dystonia plus syndromes, dystonia could be happening secondary to another process, to another major neurological uh, condition. And uh, in this way, we can divide these, and we can also consider the genetic etiologies, which, is, which may include dopamine responsive dystonia, which we saw, and myoclonus dystonia. Okay, so now we know what dystonia is, we know what causes dystonia, and we have a rough idea of the clinical etiologies and classification dystonia. Question arises, you get a dystonia patient in your clinic, how do you do the workup, how do you approach him? We're gonna, we're gonna keep in mind dystonia is a clinical diagnosis. The importance of a good history and examination cannot be overstressed. Th that history, that examination helps you find out what the classification is, and then you can proceed with the workup. 
So as part of the workup, there are three main things we want to do. We want to do a real DOPA trial. Um, this is to check for dopamine response at this moment. We want to do a neuroimaging in lab, and we want to do a genetic testing, particularly in, in cases of primary early onset dystonia. The levodopa trial is there because we want to look for this rare condition called dopamine response in dystonia. So this is a rare condition, but it's if you if you want to have a dystonia, this is the one you want to have because it's exquisitely responsive to dystonia. And in these patients, the importance of levodopa trial cannot be understated, overstated because this is how we recognize these patients. Um, if they had do not give you a response to levodopa, then we can move on to other parts of the treatment. Look for all the secondary causes of dystonia. We're going to do our imaging, which includes CT scans, MRIs, and we're going to do a blood work. So blood work would include your basic labs like CBCs, electrolytes, liver, and renal function tests. If you look for more specific causes, we can do our ANA, we can do the serial causes and copper levels. Wilson's disease is an important cause of movement disorders and dystonias. We can also do checking for signs of syphilis, the rapid plasma reagent test, and more complex tests as well. Lastly, we're going to do genetic testing. This is particularly important in patients with early onset dystonia and specific patient groups in which this may be um, increasingly pertinent might be those in whom familiar dystonias are more noticeable, such as in the Ashkenazi Jewish groups. So that sums up our workup. This whole chart should give you an idea of the treatment. So as we talked about, when you get a dystonia in a child, for example, we're going to do a levodopa trial. If that gives you a complete response, you should celebrate because this is the dopa response to dystonia. It's rare you diagnosed it and you treat the person successfully. More commonly, you will not get a response. In that case, what you would do is you would ask yourself the question, is the dystonia focal? Is it generalized or is it something else? If it's focal, then the easiest thing would be to give the person a Botox injection. In many cases, that should work and you would just continue with Botox injection. In the cases of dystonias which are not focal, such as those which are generalized, the next step would be to give the person an anticholinergic drug. These may be trihexyphenidyl or they could be something like ben benstropine. If the person responds to that, great. If not, we go to the next step of pharmacologic management, which means prescribing a benzodiazepine or baclofen. If all else fails, which is more commonly seen in the case of generalized dystonias, we would go for surgical management, of which one of the main therapies that we are developing and which has a lot of promise is deep brain stimulation. And lastly, before we get to the next case, we have a quick question. Where do neurons like to go to get married? The answer is the next slide. Now we're going to get to the fun part. That was fun. So we're going to discuss a differential diagnosis. And uh, this is a very unique case, which was actually seen in our HMC clinic. So the case is of an 85-year-old Caucasian female, which had a subacute acute onset movements, as we will see in the video. She had a history of diabetes, hypertension, pulmonary embolism, and she was hospitalized for three weeks for hyperglycemia of 700. And I can see Dr. Khan and Andy smile. So, let's see the video. So that was not a dystonia. You could have seen the rhythmic involuntary jerky movements, which were almost like they were flowing. So this is an example for chorea. More specifically, it's an example of something called CHBG, which is chorea hyperglycemia basal ganglia syndrome. So this patient was seen by the team at Houston Medical. She was she received a normal workup, which included the lab work and the imaging. And one of the unique findings which was found on her MRI, which is quite distinctive for this syndrome, was the T1 hyperintensity within the left ventricle of the pair, which led to the subsequent diagnosis. The interesting thing about this case was that it was responsive to, a, to an agent that's not your first line agent for this syndrome. So when we get a patient with CHVG, our first line thing is to direct the hyperglycemia. That was done in this case. 
The second line things, the second line management options would be your your leptics, including hemoparagol, your delta enhancing antiepileptics like benzos, and lastly you would try the beta inhibitors. So in this particular case, and the case report can be found online within the HMC website, the patient did not respond to any of the first two. She only responded to VMAT inhibitors, which basically affect the packaging and the release of dopamine, which again ties up to this entire complex neurological system where dopamine is a big player and which can manifest as dysphonias, as chorias, as apoptosis, and which can have non-motor manifestations as well. And with that, I just wanted to share with you this interesting case and to give you an idea of how broad the possible differential is for dysphonia. And I will wrap up with references. Thank you so much for listening to my lecture.